I always find it fascinating delving into other disciplines and comparing those with my own as a musician. And there's no question that there are many similarities between the world of sport and music. In fact, I've more or less finished reading a book about Roger Federer, the tennis player, which highlighted some ideas regarding how he holds his tennis racket and manipulates his hand to how I hold my sticks and mallets. So who would have guessed really? But anyway, growing up, I was blessed, as indeed the whole world was, to witness an extraordinary athlete who stamped her mark in history as being the only woman ever to hold four major track titles concurrently, Olympic, World, European and Commonwealth. Now, I just have to take a little moment to digest the magnitude of that achievement. My guest is none other than the great Sally Gunnell. Now, Sally ignited such memories through her incredible achievements as one of our finest athletes. And today I'd like to explore how important listening has been across Sally's career and to explore the similarities between musicians who learn an instrument with hours of dedicated practice and sports people who train for hours and hours to achieve great performances. I'd also like to explore what happens in both these careers when the individual decides to retire. Well, Sally has been hugely productive and influential since gracing the world's sporting arenas. She has taken her experience as a top-rung athlete and tapped into the business and corporations to impart the crucial information and experience in order to help each of us aim towards our potential and to make our world a better and more productive place. Sally, hello, and thank you hello. very much for, for joining me on this podcast. Thank you, what a lovely introduction. I enjoyed listening to that. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, but one thing we do have in common is that I believe you're a, a farmer's daughter. You were brought up in a farm. I was, yes, in Essex. So yeah, loved my farming days and, um, Family is still there, so I'm actually going to actually go and see. My dad is going to be 92 on Wednesday, so I'm oh. going to go up to the family farm and just say hello in the garden, because we're allowed to. <laughs> how wonderful. It's incredible. But how do you think growing up on a farm shaped your, your, your future journey? Because I find mm. that, you know, my oldest brother still has a family farm, and, and I actually find that I draw upon that early part of my life, I think a lot more now. I think mm. about it a lot more. I think about the, the discipline. I think about the work that we did on the farm, even as, as young yeah. kids, um, the patience with the seasons. I mean, did any of that you know, influence you in, in a way? Very much so. I mean, it is that nature nurture, isn't it? And I often look back at that and I think, what is it? And I know that, um, you know, spending that time, I was outdoors, all the time as a youngster. I was running around, I was, you know, running up to my dad when he was up on the tractor or the combine, you know, I'd be mm. cycling, I'd be climbing. Um, and I know there's a lot of research out there about it and, you know, people that, you know, achieve things on the sporting field. It's about how active they are as a young age. And, and I know that is, is so true because it's, yeah, I was always outside. And I think, the other thing was the discipline, like you said, and I think seeing my dad get up at five o'clock in the morning, go and milk the cows um, and, you know, and then still working all day. So, you know, it's that hard work you've got to put in. There's no, you know, there's no cheating around you. It's just good old solid basic hard work that you get to have results. And also I think the other thing is seeing the ups and downs because, you know, farming life is, is tough and, you know, depending on whether you've had too much rain or not enough rain or mm. whatever it may be, you know, it can affect so much of your life or whether we went on holiday or whether we didn't and all those sorts of things. So I think as growing up, I knew that there was always going to be the highs and the lows and it was about riding it out. It was about learning about it. And, you know, I was very fortunate to 
to have learned that. I mean, I joined a club when I was 12. So I think a lot of that learning almost came before that in, in those really early days. That's really interesting. And I suppose also that sense of responsibility. Um, mm. You know, again, one of the things I found on the farm was that because you were given tasks and you were around machinery, around livestock and so on, there was that sense of responsibility. And you've kind of just got to look after your own situation, really. And I can yeah. see a, a, a massive similarity with you as a sports yeah. person yeah. moving forward. You know, I've never even looked at it like that because people always say to me, you know, would you prefer being part of a team, you know, as in a football team or, you know, or a, a netball team? And I used to say, God, no, I liked... I like that responsibility. I was almost, I mean, you know, I had an amazing team around me, don't get me wrong, that helped me there. But I love to, I like to take charge almost. And, and, I, and I had never thought of it being that something that my dad always did. He was, you know, the one that was, in, you know, even though he had people working for him, but he, it was his responsibility and nobody else mm. can make those mistakes and let you down almost. And I think that's, what I liked, even though I had an amazing team around me, I had great coaches and support. You know, when you're out there on that day, <laughs> it's you that can either fail or, you know, or, or there, you know, it's nobody else mm. <laughs> because so much of it is, is about the mind and determination and things like that. So yeah, fascinating. I, I never thought of it linking it back to, yeah, yeah. just seeing how strong, you know, and, and, my dad I was on the farm. Absolutely. And I guess, you know, what you're saying about the fact that, well, ultimately, we all need a team of people, we all need that support and success doesn't really happen in isolation. But ultimately, you're the one at the starting line, or a musician, or in my case, you know, I'm the one that has to walk on that stage and deliver the goods. And there's absolutely yeah. then nothing anybody else can do for you and so you know that mindset is 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 absolutely crucial mm -hmm. but you know was there a, a particular moment when you thought right this is what I want to do I mean did you find that you were quite a competitive child growing up or did you want everything to be just so you know did everything have to be the best it could if you know what I mean um, I had two older brothers, so I think the competitive side came out because of them almost, and so you know it was always you know trying to keep up with them. So I think that's part of the competitive side of it. Um, yeah, I think that was probably I think that's something you are born with as well to a certain degree because I think I always was you know even from I don't know we, you know there was two other girls that lived on the farm and we would always still be having singing competitions or whatever else. So <laughs> I think that, you know, that real competitive edge was, was a, something that I had in there and, and still have to a, to a certain degree. But what I, I find is I like to have everything in place. So um, I, you know, I wouldn't just, even when I was younger, I wouldn't have just, you know, walked into go, yeah, I can do this or whatever else. So that wouldn't have been me. It would have been much more about, right, okay, I've got this, I've done that, I've trained here, I've done that. Okay, yes, I can do this. So it's mm. having all the bits in place almost rather than just bulldozing in and going, I can do this. And like, it, that wasn't the competitive side. It was, mm. it was, yeah, it was having the things that helped me to deliver, which was so key. Yeah, and I suppose that, you know, this whole idea of patience is so important. You cannot become a great athlete, you know, by watching someone else for five minutes on TV or, or yeah. going on to a reality show or something. It is just this hard, hard graft, even with the immense talent that you clearly had. And, mm -hmm. and it, you know, that's interesting in itself because we are bombarded with stuff at the moment where we think we can all do things, which isn't a bad mindset to be in, yeah. but it's just knowing that, well, actually, for something to have longevity, there are no shortcuts. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, when I look back to those early days of being at the club and, you know, and it didn't become serious until I probably left school at sort of 17, 18 when I had to make decisions. But, but I really loved what I did. And I don't know whether that's the same with you. You know, I loved the training. I loved mm. going to the club nights. I loved the group of people I was with. And, you know, and even though, you know, 
my, I joined my coach when I was 14 and, um, you know, my, my training was an hour away, sort of three times a week. I didn't even mind that. You know what I mean? You'd yeah, think that, yeah. you know, that would be the hard bit, but I, it never came into the conclusion because I just, I just loved, I loved that feeling of, of doing a hard session, of, of learning something new, of applying it and getting feedback and, and support from your coach and bits and pieces really. So yeah, yeah there was, it was sort of, you know, you have to have that passion and love in there from that very young age. Yes, I mean, with all of that support that you had and, and I mean, what was it in your mind that made you think, you know what, I might be able to make a profession out of this. I think I am good enough to compete. Was there a particular moment or was this just always part of your thinking that no, I will be at the Olympics or I will be one of the foremost athletes? Or was there a key moment where you thought, actually, I think I can do this? Yeah, I think, um, do you know what? I don't think the real key moment came until I was quite high up in the sport as in I, I was fifth in the Olympics and that was probably the real mm. moment even though I had dreams and aspirations of watching it all and wouldn't it be lovely I don't think I actually really comprehended what that made and, and I don't think it was if you know I always call about the reality came in probably only four years be before Barcelona I think wow. I think in my head up to there it was do you know, I, I always wanted, I think what challenged me, and I can imagine that probably we have this in common, it was about being how good I could get at something. Mm. It was about what I could apply to myself to understand, to see how good I could get from, from myself almost. Yeah. Um, rather than saying, right, I'm going to go and stand on the top of the rostrum, I'm going to go and do this. It wasn't any of that it was much more about gosh what could I if I just tried this would that make me a longer stride pattern would I become a, you know could more economical with my running all those mm. sorts of things that was the challenge that I loved it was much more of a personal thing yeah, than, um, than anything else yeah that's really interesting because you were a very accomplished long jumper and a heptathlete when when you started out but then you specialized in hurdling. So, I mean, why that changed? Was there something in your physique that you just thought, aha, you know, this perhaps might be better applied, my body might be better applied in this discipline, or, or how, how does this all work? Or is it someone else's observations of you? What, what yeah. happened there? I think it's a bit of both, really. I mean, I had an amazing coach who I was with from that 14 years old, and, um, you know, he's no longer with us. And I, and I wish that one of the questions was, because I didn't move over to the 400 hurdles from 100 hurdles for, till I was 20 years old. And I often mm. wonder, did he have that in his plan? And he, you know, because mm. it's a bit like, you know, you can over train. So if I was training for 400 hurdles from 14 mm. years old, I probably would have got injured. So he, what he was so good at was, like, you know, the multi-events was such a great background and strength, overall strength of building. Um, and then doing the 100 hurdles enabled me to get really good at the hurdles and to have that speed, which I needed. But I, w I wouldn't be surprised if the ultimate goal that he always knew, I probably never knew that, <laughs> was that 400 hurdles. And, and it, you know, it didn't come into my life until I was... 20 years old because I knew I wasn't going to ever be fast enough at the 100 hurdles and it was like but you know you could be fast enough at the 400 hurdles and have that strength and have all that background so mm. it goes back to that patience and it goes back to um, planning and learning the fundamentals of something and yeah I wouldn't be surprised if he'd probably you know when I went to him as 14 year old he saw the bigger picture and I wish, you know, I wish I had the opportunity to be able to to ask him that now. But yeah, I'm sure he would have said it was planned. <laughs> Absolutely. And it just sort of draws upon that fact that, you know, listening in a way is so crucial, you know, towards what we do ourselves. So that internal experience, but the team that is with you and supporting you, how they listen, whereby a lot of it is to do with what they see, what they feel, mm. you know, it, it's, it's quite interesting. So it's very fascinating what you're saying about your trainer and, and his observations. Yeah. Mm. 
I think what his his skill he had was that he would, um, you know, always ask me how what did I feel, and yeah. how I could improve, and it was never you know he never say oh that was terrible or you know you should try you know do it this way or you know, that's great. Mm -hmm. It was it was it was always about. Um, yeah, what he would say to me, what, what, what did you feel? How was that? And I say, well, I dropped my foot a little bit over that hurdle or should have a bit over striding a bit. And, and then he would say, yep, that's correct. And let's try this. So, and I think that as a, as a coach is, is was, you know, was such a skill because what he enabled me to do, and especially with something like 400 hurdles, which is so technical, you have to, mm. you have to think on your feet. And you know, when you're doing multi events like seven, of them, you've got to be in tune with your body, and you've got to know whether you're, I don't know, one centimeter too long in your stride or whatever it may be. And, and mm. you know, as much as you can, I don't know, have all the sports science behind it and stuff like that. There's a, there's an element of that that feeling and you've got to be taught that and, and enable that to be able mm. to happen and of course the body is changing all the time you know from a 14 year old to a 20 year old that's yeah. that's a lot of time really for the body just to develop in in subtle ways yeah. even you know and then yeah. for you to tweak the end little percentage in what yeah. you do that would make that big difference yeah, and you know, and, and as you get older, the, the hurdles get higher, they get, you know, a little bit heavier and <laughs> all those sorts of things. And yeah, and you know, you go through because, you know, you, you pick up injuries because you try, you've grown so much in the last month, and <laughs> all those sorts of things. And, it, and it's, you know, and it's frustrating at the time, but it's good to have somebody there like Bruce was to, to understand that and, and just say, yeah, well, you know, that's, part of why we've got to miss six months is because your body's all over the place and yeah you know, and it can't cope at the moment but let's try and do this to strengthen other areas or whatever and I think it's just <clears throat> I think I think what I, I he put in me installed in me as well is wanting to to please him even though as we talked at the beginning you're very much an individual I think by him wanting me to feed to him back to him it was it was, a, it was a strong relationship that I was at that point where I wanted to get his reassurance all the time. And I think, uh, I think that was in a really important part of it as well. I wasn't just, mm. yes, I was doing it for myself, but I was doing it for him as well because I wanted him to be pleased that I'd made these changes and that I'd done this. And, and yeah, he was a very influence, influential character in my life. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I'm sure there must have been moments, you know, you, you talked about the highs and lows, um, you know, certainly growing up on the farm and, and that is just, you know, life in a way with any profession that you're involved with. But, you know, were there moments when you felt just unmotivated, you know, or struggled with the training or you just didn't really want to get on that track or get up in the morning? And what was that process? How do you just overcome that? Yeah, I mean, there was many a days where it was pouring with rain and I'd just go, right, I'm not training today, I'm not going to train. And then by about four o'clock in the afternoon, I'd go, well, actually, you know, my competitors, my rivals mm. um, were out there and they would probably trained that day. So why would I be giving them a day? Yeah. Uh, and that, and I would then end up going out to do something. So, you know, it's even though you feel that individuality as well but there is something about you know your the respect for your rivals that you had and um, mm. you know they were the reason that spurred you on even though you were trying to be the best that you could be but they helped you to spur you on because yeah. you know you just yeah you would just say well they're probably training hard they're probably doing this and even though it was outside of your control you got to make sure that you're putting that work and it goes back to that work almost but it also does. I think you know, yes, we have to work hard, but we have to be clever with it and you have to be um, productive with it almost because you can't just, you know, the biggest thing with the sports is, is overtraining. And I think the thing as I got older 
it was being smart about your training and it was about you know which sessions really work rather than just you know amounts and mm. what and how you're and understanding which ones are effective and which ones you need to tweak a little bit more and yeah and that's again the years of understanding and and bruce always used to say you know to to stop the body from getting injured it, you know we did the same basics or often for many many years and he would just increase the amount by probably i don't know three or four percent each year it was just tiny wow. amounts just the, the quantity of it to make yeah. sure that we were progressing but without overdoing it so a real skill mm. and that that you know aspect of of training smartly not necessarily yeah. you know the amount of time and that's very similar to musicians where you know when you're young you're oh, we practice for hours and hours and hours and hours and and eventually you'll, you'll get somewhere but actually it is much more about how you practice you know what are you aiming for within a 15 minute period or yeah. or 10 minutes or something and and that becomes very prevalent you know once you actually start working and and you've got yeah. so many of life's you know issues to deal with and and admin and one thing or another and just living and and then those 10 minutes become incredibly precious you know yeah. and they're almost just like a uh, razor sharp moment of time that you absolutely pinpoint yeah. and, and focus on yeah so. i can imagine and i think the other thing i learned was just um you know the other aspects and i guess it's a lot of what i'm talking about in my life in these days but it's just how important recovery is and you know and quality recovery we're not just sitting up talking about lounging on your sofa all afternoon it is about you know that switching off and, and the body being able to repair itself mm. and, and what does that look like and um, that that was a really important part towards the end as well so yeah yeah, yeah. and i suppose mentally too um, i know after a performance you know you 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 need time and as you say it, it isn't just a well you know five minutes on a on a on a sofa it's you need time to to feel the experience not just think about it but to really feel and then consider the actions it's it's very mm. difficult mm. to explain unless but i think maybe that's where we go back to our farming background so for me it would be getting back out in into nature and getting back out into the fields which mm. would um allow me to reflect and yeah and just sort of work out and then to be able to go what is the next sort of stage and and even now you know i know that as soon as we could afford to you know we, we found a bit of open space that <laughs> i had that because that was a really important part to you know my recovery when i was was training at that intensity and um yeah mm. it still is now and i think i think that's the understanding of having our backgrounds maybe but that's that's what we've learned and of how to have that space in our minds to be able to be creative and to mm. clear and to plan ahead almost absolutely can I ask what is more stressful to follow up a win or to deal with injury? Oh, um, gosh, As I've never been asked that. That's quite interesting. They're both, they're, they're, they're both different. I mean, the hardest thing is, is, um, I found was, was going from an Olympic champion to breaking the world record and a world champion because you know, it is that whole thing of being at the top and everybody gunning for you and uh, just people's expectation and pressure. And that's very different to being on the journey on the way up. Mm. Um, and yeah, and that took a lot of adjustment. That took a lot of work and a lot of understanding and um, yeah, I learned a lot about myself and who I was as a person to be able to get myself in the right place to, to keep going again and again. Mm. Um, but when you come back to injuries, injuries are, you know, were, were tough. And I sort of, I mean, I, was, I had a few injuries when I was early on in my career, but I, I then had injuries after I'd won the four majors. And I don't know whether I ever really got to, uh, to really understand them. And I don't know whether that's because the passion had, had gone from the sport because I'd achieved everything that I'd aimed to do. 
Um, so I didn't have that fighting. I didn't have that determination that you need sometimes to, to get over injuries. So, you know, having a, a year out with, you know, surgery and bits and pieces, I didn't, I found that I was struggling to get that fight back almost to go and get another Olympic gold medal. It was, it was, you know, so I think sometimes it is about, you know, the passion that's still there. And if that's still in place and, um, you know, you can't, you can't have that unless, you can't achieve unless you've got that passion within mm. that still. Mm. So, it's yeah, still it's, it's tough. And, and I sometimes admire, you know, I look at someone like Kelly Holmes who won that double Olympic gold medal in, in Athens and, and hers was driven by years of injuries and years of things going wrong and even on the day. And, you know, it's something that I didn't have to do to that extent and, you know, and massive admiration. But I guess what kept her driving is that she had quite got there and she was still wanting it and whatever situation you're in you still got to have that drive yeah and that is the key I suppose it's it's like a musician winning lots of awards and Grammys or whatever yeah, it might be yeah. but actually what is it that really keeps them going and it is yeah. just that one yeah. word passion really yes. exactly and I think sometimes having new new um you know, mixing it up and having new ideas or some, trying something new, I think is, is, is a really good point when you are struggling and stuff. So. Indeed, yeah. Sally, what were some of the mental strategies you employed during training and also away from the track and also the lead up to a competition? Yeah, I think um, the mental side was, was an enormous part of it. And, and that's about confidence, isn't it? And belief in your own ability. And I think that's the thing that you know whoever you are whatever you're doing in background in, in life it's what holds us back isn't it and yeah. and that was the way I always used to say that this was the last piece of the jigsaw almost was to really go and and do this and understand it and um the piece I learned uh, that was very much around visualization and um seeing yourself uh, actually, you know actually delivering um, rather than it being a sort of scary place because you know you trained all year for this Olympics and you know it's very easy to think oh, I'll worry about it when I have to and I'll put it over there and mm. but the problem with that is you you know the day rocks up and you're absolutely petrified because it's not familiar <laughs> to it so um, so I think the um yeah, the mental side is, is an enormous part and it was almost like the last piece of the jigsaw almost and I think it was about actually seeing yourself, uh, you know, that whole piece around visualization and um, actually seeing yourself in that stadium and, and executing what you've got to do. And, and I think up until I'd learned how to do this, it was very much, you know, oh, it's a scary place. I'll just train for it and then I'll worry about it. But of course you then get out there and you're like, oh my God, this is, this is horrible. Mm. Um, and so it was about, I spent, you know, 12 months before Barcelona just, going through that race in my mind, every stride pattern, every, uh, every how it was gonna feel. And I would see myself from the outside, looking at myself within, mm. watching it around, how smooth it would be. Um, the other thing I used to do was actually, if things went wrong, so you didn't panic, um, and because things will, could go wrong, you might just slightly clip a hurdle, you might, I don't know, be a headwind or you don't run very well in the semi and you don't get a good lane, but you know, you can still win. You can still do this. So how you change it and how you get into it. So I did, yeah, I used to spend probably every day about, I don't know, 20 minutes and, and getting nearer to the, to the race, probably about three, four, five times a day, just, going wow. through that race and how it was going to feel and just yeah just having clarity having complete clarity and what my job was out there and what I was going to deliver and that's the time I can run if I run it like this and you know and hopefully that's good enough and that's it's incredible that's what I did and then I think on the actual day and um it's about yeah controlling that inner voice i always say we always have that butted voice it's probably mm. the one with you it's like oh, gosh there's a big audience and yeah. uh, you know something whatever and if you start listening to all the negatives and you start feeding yourself you know my back hurts today and oh, this is the day then 
you're never going to go out there and mm. perform. So it was about saying, you know, I'm in the best shape of my life. I've eaten everything well. I've trained hard. If I don't do it today, I'm never going to have this chance again. You know, just go out there, give it your best shot. So it was about feeding that and to control those negative thoughts because they're always used to come in. I used to... Um, sort of like stop a negative thought from, from peering in my head. I used to screw it up in a piece of paper uh, <laughs> visually and just throw yeah. it out and go, do you know what? You are the best. You know, yeah. you deserve this. Mm. You worked hard for this. And mm. but sometimes you have, you're in control. You had to feed the confidence to yourself. And, and I think we're, as a nation, we're very quick at putting ourselves down. And, um, mm. you know, it goes back to that whole piece around being kind to yourself and, and things like that. And, you know, yeah, it's something you have to almost teach yourself to be able to do. And in a way, the art of visualization, I mean, there's a lot talked about that, you know, in the sporting world. And a little bit, I would say, in the music world as well. But it's still, I think, a discipline to do it, you know, yeah. to, to just find that space, that moment when you're comfortable with yourself in order to do it. And, and I, I, would, I would love to do it more than I, I really do, to be honest. I don't think it's something I do enough of. But, um, but it is interesting. And, and that chatter that you have in your head is absolutely crucial yeah. to try to, you know, have that positive conversation mm -hmm. with yourself. Really. I, I used to find that being able to do the visualization, I couldn't just lie down and think about it. I had to be going for a walk or, um, you know, just doing something. Yes. It, yeah. Walking was my best thing. And it, it still is now if I'm trying to remember a talk I've got to do or a speech or something then I will walk and talk it and that's how I, it seems to go in. And that's what I used to do with the, mm. with the racing. I'd sort of like, you know, be you know, walking around or sometimes just running up and down stairs or something, <laughs> just, or, you know, yep. just jogging or something that I would then have that process. It had to be quite active rather than just lying there almost and thinking about it. Yes. Yes. I, I, I absolutely understand what you're saying. So how important is it to listen to your own body and mind and and has this been even more highlighted since you retired from being an athlete mm. yeah i mean i think um i mean I've, I've talked about having to be in tune with your body and to re mm. really be able to read it and know if you're not firing 100 percent, then you've got to ease it down that was a really important skill and i think that's something that i do listen to now but it, it's it's very different because you don't have um you know you don't have a, a a set goal of you know being that olympic champion so you know exercise and activity and you know a lot of i do within work and you know i think like that it, it's it's much more around um preventative stuff it's much more around mm. you know being the best version that you can be at this point in your life <laughs> and i think that's that's mm. what sort of is important I, you know i've had to adapt almost and it's not about push 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 it's yep. it's coming back to say right okay so i, I feel tired today or, and you know is that because i've eaten rubbish yesterday and you know it's more about that sort of thing and, and being able Indeed. to help support others almost rather than this real intense selfishness that you almost had when you were running you mm. know now it's about being the best version you can be in what we're trying to do but trying to be able to share that with so it's really it's it's been you know almost quite hard to adapt that because it's, it's very very different to that mm. intensity you had when it's you know it's just you <laughs> and you're just going for it so absolutely yeah, and easy. i suppose a lot of these skills you're able to share with your immediate family yeah that i mean you can i try and share it with others really and, and i think that's often been the important thing i think i've just i've learned so much from my running and you know of just you know how what life is like and how hard it is at times and how you pick yourself up and how you move on and how you don't dwell on it for the next you know six mm. months or whatever which is such a an easy natural thing that we all do but we've, yeah, i've had to overcome those to be able to move on and i think it's it's nice to be able to actually sit back and reflect and work out how I did it and why I did it and, mm. you know, what was the importance of it and then be able to now have time to explain that to, to others and, but still learning, 
you know, a lot of stuff that we do now, you know, I'm in my fifties now and, and you start to, you get to that point where you think, God, you know, I want to still have my balance and, or, you know, be able to think clear and all those sorts of things when I'm, you know, if we're, if we're going to be here for a little bit longer and lucky enough to, yes. what, what can I put in place and what can I share? So you just, mm. yeah, just how you keep changing almost. Mm. And do you feel that, you know, we've kind of touched on this already, but being self-motivated, which you are and which you have had to be as an athlete and so dedicated creates some sort of self-centeredness. And is this a necessary engagement ingredient you know in order to be the very best at, at what you do I mean I know for example uh, being a musician that uh, you know we can be very selfish people actually <laughs> and we can be actually dare I say quite selfish listeners as well yeah. because we're listening to a specific thing but then you get exhausted at listening you know you yeah. need that time to just not listen yeah. to anything or anybody so it can be perceived as being self-centered yeah oh totally and um i had to consciously think about it when i did retire because you know your whole life is about me 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 and then all of a sudden you might have kids but you know you actually say you, i don't know you just get i think you just get older and you just think god i am you know i'm just <laughs> you know you feel like you're you're always right and it's not always the case uh, <laughs> It is about learning to listen to from others and it's mm. yeah and but you know when so to retire from the top of my sport you know I retired at 31 which is yeah. ridiculous isn't it so mm. you're 31 years old and you're probably you know you've achieved this but you're quite a selfish person so you then from then on have then got to change the way that you think and your mentality and and, start, and, you know, I would say it's probably taken me the good 20 years to, to get to where I am now. And, yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, still some ups and downs and still learning about yourself. You're always learning about ourselves, which is really important, yeah. isn't it? But, yeah, I've had to, I have had to change and, and adapt as, as an individual, for sure, to mm. allow children into my life and allow, you know, to, mm. to move on to helping and, others. And, and in a way... Right in my mind. Yeah, and, and in a way, you know, the age of 31 feels really young nowadays. Yeah. You know, athletes go on and sports people in general can go on for, you know, considerably longer than they used to do. Yeah. But but yeah. that that time when you felt that, oh, you know, perhaps I need to think about uh, embarking on another journey. I mean, how was that? Was it a sudden decision? Was it something that just crept into your whole psyche? Was the body mm -hmm. telling you, oh, you know what? Or, you know, this this must have been quite a moment. Yeah, I think it's, re it's a really difficult moment because, you know, you don't want to have regrets. You don't want to go, oh, why did I do that? Mm. And I think I had a couple of years. At, and once it's, it's interesting, once it starts coming into your mind, um i would say you're building up to it and you yeah. need to because it's um yeah you need you can't have those sort of thoughts of you know am i still enjoying it do i still want to be doing this and and i mm. think the thing that i had a couple of injuries in the last two years but i was thinking about when is the right time and all these sorts of things in the injuries um and it it was the weirdest thing because i did a, a world, I think it was the world championships, got injured again in the semi-final. Um, and I, without telling anybody, I called this press conference and just said, that's it, I'm retired. So my coach was like, oh, okay. My wow. husband was like, oh, okay. <laughs> wow. And it was the biggest relief of my life. And I knew at that moment it was so the right thing. And I've never looked back. And I think the thing that... I had had enough of was was pressure and expectation. That's mm. because of what you've done. People expected you to always go out and win and always deliver. And you know, and you realise that sometimes you can't always do that. And yeah, I think I just I'd had enough. I just and I just knew straight away it was the right thing. But you know, you then have to adapt your life. Mm. And I think I was very lucky that I fell pregnant straight away. So 
you know, there was to learn to love something else. And mm. I had lots of exciting offers in my life. So I had things in place. And I'd always been somebody that was driven by uh, goals and, and attainable things that I could get my head around. And that's, that's how I dealt with it. And, um, but I know a lot of the men in our sport really struggle much more than the women. Mm. Um, and I think it's because of the camaraderie and the real highs that you get. Um, and yeah, and I, I know I've sort of put it in the right place. I just always knew that I was so lucky to have achieved what I achieved and I'm never going to feel those highs again. And, and I think I just had great people around me that always brought me, me myself back to, to the ground almost. And I think that, that they sort of helped me to, to mm. deal with that side of things. Yeah. And I, I, I suspect that, you know, being so self-motivated means that you're used to creating your own opportunities you know and the discipline yeah. of that and the patience of that and and you know we've we've talked about it a little bit but uh, because some people may not have already things in the pipeline you know no. to no. to immediately no. embark on so it, it is interesting yeah with, with i think you have to you have to create them and, and you know my goals are never as big as they used to be obviously but i still you know and it might be just you know, learning to garden, which is what I'm doing at the moment. So they don't have to be massive. Do you know what yeah. I mean? That they can just be, you know, just achievable things. That, you know, it's about having meaning and purpose for your day. Yes. And that's really, really key. And, you know, even, you know, during lockdown, it's been tough. And, but, but I think having that meaning and purpose and knowing what I'm going to do on that day, and it might only be go for a walk with the dog for an hour or so, but it's still meaning and purpose. And that's really key. Mm. And when you did retire, I mean, going from all of the physical training that you had obviously embarked on, what did you notice about your body that, mm. that changed? Was it the suppleness? Was it the energy? I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm not an athlete, so... Yeah, no, <laughs> uh, I think it's how it changes so quickly. So your yeah. speed just goes. Um, you know, you're not fast anymore. Um, yeah, your body's, you know, your muscles aren't as toned as they used to be. Yeah. You know, even though, you know, I, I suppose I had children, so I put on weight more than I had. And, you know, and I never have to worry about your weight and things yeah. like that. Um, so yeah, things were different physically in that sort of sense. I think the things that I enjoyed more than anything was having choice. I had uh, choice of what I exercise I wanted to do. I wasn't yeah. forced to do or, mm. you know, should have done. You know, I could wake up this morning and go, oh, I'm just going to go for a walk today or I might do a Pilates class or oh. I might go skiing, which I couldn't do. So it was lovely to have that choice. Yeah. Um, I think it was realising that exercise is, is really key to me and my mental health and, um, yeah, and, and understanding that. But I thought also I think it's about Again, I, so in my early days when I retired, I found other things like running a half marathon. I ran the marathon. And so it was a completely different change. Um, and it wasn't anything to do with the type of training that I'd done. And it was another sort of little, it was a challenge. And, and I think yeah. that really helped to have something mm. that I was sort of physically nice doing as well. Absolutely. And I think this whole year that we've experienced, you know, that, that, we've looked closer to home as regards to what is in front of us, what are our, our small goals, what makes life meaningful, um, you know, within the confines yeah. of our own home and things like that. So things like gardening yeah. or taking up cooking or a, a, just something that you would not have ordinarily yeah. have done has been so important to people's yeah. well-being. Uh, yeah, uh, enormously. And, um, yeah, and just getting outside, isn't it? And there's something as simple as going for a 20 minute walk and you make me feel so much better. You know, I shout less at the kids if I've done a bit of exercise, you know what I mean? It's just, <laughs> it's that sort of thing. But I think it's allow us, I think it's allow us to understand ourselves a little bit more and, um, and think about, you know, it's not all about, I don't know, money and what you have and, you know, comparing yourself to everybody else or whatever else, because, you know, we can't do that or even on social media. So I think it's just allowed us to 
think a little bit about ourselves and our families and you know and just yeah just put this in touch with human things that's what I call it so yeah really key yeah and again we've touched on this really but you know you now motivate others to use the same kind of focus and and perseverance um, as you have had being a an athlete and so you're tapping into the businesses corporations and you know what can we learn from athletes what can we read what can they take mm -hmm. away when they meet you I think there is a number of things and I think as organizations are you know they're they're pushing their staff they're often having to make cuts people are doing you know two or three people's jobs or whatever it is and I think now more than ever with with what's been happening that that you know people are now much more in tuned with their not just their physical health but their mental health as well and you know the connection between if you're not in a good place or if you're not physically capable of um you know how how much of a struggle that is to do your day-to-day -day things and whether that's working whether that's you know being creative whether that's you know just whatever it may be and and just how much of a crossover there is around um just who you are as individuals and you know the importance of being able to go out and and deliver at, at a high quality really and i think you know more and more people are now thinking you know I, I i need to take charge i need to look after myself and i'm not sleeping enough i eat rubbish i'm not exercising and so so much of it comes back to what i learned with uh, when i was running and how some of those little things see so insignificant but they are the difference of you um you know <laughs> performing at whatever you're going to do uh, whether that's on stage whether that's in the workplace whatever it may be and not performing to your, your your capabilities almost and you know I always used to say that I always remember someone saying to me you know what that pillow from your bed at home is the key to you winning that Olympic gold medal you know it might seem so insignificant but those little things all add up to who we are so you know for me it's about passing on you know how we deal with mental health how we can physically um, get ourselves in shape to be able to to lose uh, weight to have the energy to have the health to be able to just you know live day to day at the best version of what we can be has lockdown revealed something about you that you hadn't realized before Gosh, what has lockdown revealed? Um, mm. a, a, a number of things. I think it's taught me to get off the rat race. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and I think something that's something that sport always allows you, to, makes you do almost. You're always on to the next thing. You, mm. you don't reflect very much. And I think lockdown has, has allowed me to reflect. And I think that's, it's, it's an important part of who we should be um, and I think it's about appreciating what we've got and uh, reflecting on you know just friends family and that sort of thing and and I think something that you know high in sport that's almost what it takes away so even now you know we're talking 20 years on or so I'm still still learning <laughs> absolutely <laughs> and um, you know and I guess lockdown has, has allowed me to, to you know understand that part of me yes indeed one question I, I should have asked ages ago was did, did music play a part in your training process in your motivation at all um, only as part of relaxation. So okay. I wasn't one that liked to listen, because a lot of sports people listen to music now. Mm. Um, and I'm much more like, to, I like to be in my own thoughts. Yes. And rather than switching off, and uh, which, mm. I, you know, everybody, you know, warms up differently and has different ways. I like to be in control of my own thoughts rather than hiding it almost. So 
Mm. Um, but afterwards, that was always very key to come back to my house. You, you know, there was never anything in there that would remind me of running um, and music, you know, listening to music and playing music in, in my room before I'd compete and afterwards was, was a really, really important part of it. And um, mm. yeah, I grew up with music with my mum, played the piano and sung and things like that. So I was surrounded by music and one of my nieces is very talented. Um, and something I tried, but sport was just all I wanted to do. So yeah, it, it's, it's the gamble, isn't it? It must have been like that almost, but yeah. But it is fascinating what you're saying there about having, you know, that kind of landscape of your own thoughts rather than feeding yet another thing to try and, and, and you know, perhaps mm. potentially aid the, the situation. But, and also, you know, when you're saying that, well, when you went back to your home, there was nothing to do with running there. And I can, comp even although I'm surrounded by instruments here, but actually it, I find that it can be easy to overload your situation. Yeah. You know, I'm a musician and the last thing I do is play music for pleasure, you know, as a hobby yeah. or, or something. <laughs> I just don't do it basically. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it is finding that balance yeah. and being comfortable with it. It is. And, and you know, and, and like with everything, it takes time to find that balance. Mm. And um, mm. yeah, and sometimes a bit of maturity, doesn't it, to understand you. Yes. And lastly, Sally, if you were given the choice, would you like to be an athlete in this decade as opposed to when you competed? What do you think have, has changed mm. along the way? So we've got um, social media, we have all sorts of avenues for people. Yeah, to... I, I think I would have preferred, I'd stick to where I was. I think, yeah, I think social media is really hard because everybody's sort of judging you and, and it would have been a whole different mental aspect that you have to learn on top of everything else. Um, you know, I think, you know, some of the good things that have happened now is obviously lottery money, but there was something about you know, when I was up and coming and I, you know, had a part-time job in an accountant and I worked and, um, you know, there's something about, um, you know, taking charge and, you know, and, and working because you've done it rather than somebody else has given you the lottery money and that sort of thing. So I think that kept the hunger. I think that was really key. Um, and I guess, yeah, now, you know, athletics was a major part back in the 90s. You know, there was only... I don't know, five of us from that Olympics in Barcelona that won. So you became that household name almost, wasn't it? Whereas now, you know, this, it's, it's brilliant because there's so much sport around, but there's so many sporting women and men and, and everything that you had to sort of, you know, be up against almost. So, yeah, no, I think I'd, I'd stick to, I mean, I'd love the sports science side of things that there is now, but, you know, whether that's good or bad, who knows? <laughs> Well, it's amazing. And, and just from my point of view, I just want to say a massive thank you. As I said at the beginning, the, the absolute pleasure and joy that you gave to the world, really, you know, as we watched your incredible achievements. And I mean, they were extraordinary. I mean, do you, do you sometimes just sit there with a cup of tea and think, my God, Sally, that was pretty amazing. <laughs> you, you know. But only now. <laughs> Even I'm it's pinching like, myself and taken, I'm not even you, you know. It's, <laughs> it's taken all these years to do that. You know, it's taken my boys, uh, what the youngest is 15 and the eldest is nearly 23, like going, yeah, you were quite good once, weren't you? It's like, yeah. And, it's, and, it, and you know, it's taken years to, to be able to. And, and I guess, that, again, that comes with age, isn't it? And that reflection piece almost. Like, and also my, my husband coaches, so he's got the elite athletes here and, you know, they're, they're on their journey and it's, it's hard, you know, and you're oh. sort of like, wow, God, we've been through that, which is amazing. So Brilliant. Yeah. Well, brilliant, Sally. Thank you so, so much. I, I, I'm just very grateful that you've been able to, to spend this time with me and, yeah. uh, and just, you. you know, talking to you like this is massively inspiring. I mean, we all need to be inspired no matter where we are in our journeys or indeed what we do. So just thank you so much for, for that. Thank you. Yeah, it was a really interesting interview and it was nice to come from, from other angles as well. So thank you very much. Thank you.